Today's speaker is James Corboy. James is a comes to us from uh, California. He's a middle school teacher, and in 2018 he was here in Austin. He completed his master's degree at UT under the direction of Dr. Scott Tinker. His focus was on the use of teaching tools. Uh, using film as a teaching tool to learn about energy. James, we're very excited that you're here with us today. Thank you very much. And just to let you know, if you have questions during this, please send your emails to zoomarama at beg.utexas.edu. Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is James Corboy, or Jim Corboy. And I am going to be talking to you about the Switch Energy Alliance and our newly developed Switch Classroom. If you give me just a second, you should be seeing my screen. This is my PowerPoint that I'll be working off of. And uh, Switch Energy Alliance is a nonprofit organization dedicated to inspiring um, students to study and learn about energy education. And we do it in a nonpartisan and sensible and objective way. All right, we started out. Uh, putting together the passions of two individuals that live in Austin, Dr. Tinker and his friend, film extraordinaire, Harry Lynch. Um, and they made a film called Switch. It received a lot of accolades, both in the ind industry and also with environmental groups. And so from that, we built, um, we're now doing a museum, an IMAX film. It's called Energy in Our Lives. We have over 300 videos in our uh, switchon.org website. Um, and we have just created over the last two years um, a switch classroom, which is an online energy education platform. And I'm going to introduce you to to our platform. Switch. All right. First off, switch film. The switch film was the first, and that's what I did my research on. I used it at the University of Texas at Austin and a bunch of schools around the country. And what I did is I had a survey go in and a survey out after watching the film and to see if students will learn from film. And we had a lot of great success with that. Uh, but the film is a basically straightforward look at all the different ways we provide energy. And from that film, Dr. Tinker and Harry Lynch learned one thing that they didn't cover in this. And that is there is about 2 billion people um, that do not have energy. Or if they do have energy, it's not clean. Um, it causes damage to their children, causes damage to the eyes. And so they created this film called Switch On. It's just recently been released. Um, it's a fabulous film. And we're just going to watch one short little trailer um, to inspire you to go watch it. I would in inspire you to watch both these films. The feature film Switch is available online. Uh, but we're going to look at the trailer. And I hope you enjoy. Without electricity, transformation of economy and the coming out of poverty is impossible. Energy is everything. The smoke is the main issue here. There's no vent, no window opening. <laughs> you can hear the kids, you can hear their lungs, you can hear them when they cough. I mean, it, that's got to have killed people. So many people are dying because of that. You touch this house. Yeah. <laughs> Electricity's not working. The Achilles heel to all of these mini grid systems is the battery. The more time the ceiling fans are running, the bigger the battery has to be. Capacity is around 6.3 gigawatts. So that's six or seven nuclear reactors. Vâng, chính xác. Bởi vì than là cuộc sống của rất nhiều người ở đây, nên chưa từ bỏ được ngay ạ. But like gold. There's mobile technology that's allowing all of this Absolutely. to yes. happen. Absolutely. Yes. Got it. Okay. Once they saw this gas coming in. People decided to switch. So this is sort of what it was, and that's yeah. the future. And that's the future. <laughs> We're very fortunate. We can choose what we do when we use power. We don't give people that choice. We want to give people that freedom. There are some ideas here. We hope that our children will be better than us. We all hope. All right, so 
that's our new film. Um, we highly recommend people going to watch it. I'm going to come back to my next slide. Um, so the next thing that we've done at Switch Energy Alliance, we were asked by a couple of museums to create an IMAX film. Um, that's coming out to your local museums. It's called Energy in Our Lives. Um, it's a Hollywood production, high definition film um, that looks at, got Dr. Tinker coming in on a, boat, on a bus with two students. Um, the two students get off the bus and as the bus drives away, it disappears. And it shows all the different ways that we use energy. Um, and at one point it leaves the kids sitting out in the field without their house, without their refrigerator, and then slowly shows them all the different ways energy goes into making all these different products that we get to use. Um, and that should be out shortly. But our big focus is the Switch Energy Library. And we have a video library. You can go in here and become an energy expert on your own. Uh, there are 300 videos for you to watch. There's interviews with experts. We have it broken down into types. So you can just pick what kind of type of energy you want to look at. We have topics. Um, and when I came along, one of the things we found out was there's a class, an advanced placement environmental science class. And when you look at our switch energy labs and switch energy primers, they really connect well to the standards that are expected to be taught in that class. And so we took these two sections, the energy labs, which is under the topics and the primers, they're 42 films, and we put them together, we brought questions to them, we brought uh, summative questions, um, and, and then we combined different videos, and that's how we came up with our Switch Classroom. There also is a whole bunch of energy experts, and I'm gonna leave you with one that I really like. Uh, it's a guy out in West Texas that st started the Roscoe Wind Farm, Cliff Etheridge, and I will come back to him in just a second. So the way our classroom works, if you're an educator or, or if you're a student, um, we give you this um, token to set up your class. So your teacher goes in and sets up the class, they give you the token, and then you sign up into the class. So the switch classroom, so we're gonna get you, we're not gonna get you to sign up, it's just too much work um, to sign up into the classroom. But once you sign up in the classroom, you can see I've set up a class right here. It's called Austin Earth Science Zoomerama. And in that classroom, I have a dashboard and I'd be able to see all the different students that, uh, that sign up to my class. Um, I view what their progress was in the class. And I have, I've set this up so far with um, a class or a lesson on wind. And the reason why I did wind is because it really connects to um, students in Austin and the students in the state of Texas. So I'm gonna start out before I go on to this. And if there's any students out there or teachers or anybody out there, we're gonna put our poll up. SJ, uh, my co-host co in this from Switch Energy Alliance, she is gonna put the poll up and we're gonna ask you a question. Which state produces the most electricity from wind? And that poll is up and we're gonna give you a little bit of time. It looks like I've got five participants and if they can uh, vote on that. So which state produces the most electricity from wind? Is it Florida? Is it the state of California? The state of Texas or the state of Montana? I'm encouraging everybody that's in this poll to vote. It might be a little difficult for you. So I'm gonna stop it right now. And if we can end that poll, that is correct. Uh, the two people that did vote, um, state of Texas, generates more wind, uh, more electricity from wind energy than any other state in the union. And we're gonna look at why that is the case. All right, so we have three different parts to this class that we're teaching from Switch Classroom. We have a video. We always start all of our um, instruction and lessons and units um, with a video. That's what our specialty is, is film with, Doc, uh, with Harry Lynch. Um, and then we have some questions and answers, most usually multiple choice, and then something that makes you have to write a write written response or create something, okay? So we're gonna start out with the science of wind to try to better understand why Texas was able to take advantage of all their wind and what other states might and what do they need to take advantage of the wind. All right, we're gonna watch this film. It's called Making Wind Work. Wind turbines are just a generator and some blades on top of a long pole. When the wind blows, it turns the generator and makes electricity. It's simple and fast to build. There's no fuel to burn, so there are no emissions. It's one of the most affordable renewables. 
In the U.S., we have perhaps the greatest onshore wind resource in the world. But there are very few wind farms in just a fraction of this area. Why is that? Let's take a look at a state that has developed its wind resource. Texas sits at the base of the wind corridor, so it has good wind. But it took more than that. Wind turbines are enormous industrial machines, so it takes neighbors willing to live near them. Farmers in West Texas were happy to have a new source of income, especially since the farmland beneath the turbines is still usable. There are minor issues related to light and noise, but the primary environmental concern is bird kill. These windy areas are not near major cities, but Sweetwater is a lot closer to Houston than North Dakota is to San Francisco. To move the power to users requires long distance transmission lines. There aren't a lot in the wind corridor, but Texas already had some related to oil and gas fields. That allowed the wind industry to get started. But the wind farms soon overloaded the existing lines, so we needed new ones. Unlike in most states, power lines in Texas are paid for by the consumer on their electric bill. This allowed new lines to be built. Lastly, wind farms produce electricity according to when and how the wind's blowing. Unfortunately, that doesn't usually match the way we use electricity. So we need something to power this when this isn't turning. The best sources for this are hydro and natural gas, since they can start and stop fast as the wind changes. Texas doesn't have a lot of water, but it has a lot of natural gas power plants to balance the wind. Because Texas has all the items on this list, it's become the U.S. leader in wind. The same is true elsewhere. Those who have succeeded have some combination of these. If we could get more of these advantages into the U.S. wind corridor, we'd see more wind power generated there. So each one of these films, the 42 that we've used for, to create the switch classroom, each one of them you can see at the end of it has a summary of the film itself. Um, so as a student, um, you're gonna go, we're gonna go next directly to the multiple choice question that's connected to this. And this would be the first place you would go back to maybe, oh, I don't know the answer to that. You might wanna look here first before you actually go back and watch the film. Um, we've set up the switch classroom so that you have to get these multiple choice questions right. All right, so you're gonna to have to go back to the film sometimes if you get something wrong. We're gonna do a poll rather than you going to the classroom. Um, we thought that would be a little too difficult the way this is set up. So we're gonna start doing a poll of each one of these four questions that are connected to the video we just watched. So question number one, and if we can put the poll up, what are two advantages? What are two advantages of using wind turbines to generate electricity? So read the air answers quest on the answers carefully. Turbines are quick to build and produce no CO2 emissions when generating. Turbines can be located anywhere and produce no CO2 emissions when generating. Turbines produce no CO2 emissions when generating and produce a constant supply of electricity or or cheap turbines can be located anywhere and produce a constant supply of electricity. So we've got one person to vote. Remember, it's always the best answer because um, these are very close, they are very similar. Um, so find the best answer. All right, so the correct answer is turbines are quick to build. Thank you. Good, then we got three of you voting. Yay, I was cheering that with my students. If I can get all my students to vote on my poll, I'm super excited. All right, so turbines are quick to build and produce no CO2 emissions when generating. They have to be placed though in a very specific place where there's lots of wind. All right, question number two. What area of the continental, continental United States that's on the land has the greatest potential for wind power? Is it the South, the North, the Midwest, or the West? And close the poll. And the correct answer is the Midwest. 
Texas is down here at the base of that corridor, but it goes all the way across the continental United States. And this is some of the best on continental wind that you'll find anywhere in the world. Question number three, what it primary environmental concern of wind farms is highlighted in the video? Wow, someone jumped on that really fast. Like, I know that one. All right, let's get it. See if we can get all three of our voters. We got four, but let's we, we seem to be able to get three voters. What is the primary environmental concern of these wind farms? Two votes. Excellent. We're going to stop there because it's three for three and bird kill. Um, birds are just flying along and they don't see those big wings, uh, the big turbines, the blades. Um, and we do have a lot of bird kill around these wind turbines. Okay, the last question that goes with this video is question number four. It's poll number five. And the question is, according to the video, why was it easier for the wind industry to start in Texas? Okay. There was no opposition from other power plants. There were existing transmission lines. Uh, there were state subsidies for the power industry that benefited the wind industry, or there were no opportunity who protested the wind industry starting in Texas. Got two answers. Let's see if we can get one more. Excellent. So everybody got this right. Um, you should get this right from the state of Texas. There were already transmission lines available coming from the West Texas, where we got lots of oil and gas out there, um, coming to the big cities. And not only that, but Texas has some four major cities, right? They got Austin, San Antonio, Houston, and, and Dallas. And when we look at the, um, the National Renewable Energy Lab, which is the second, um, there's not many big cities up in that other part of the, um, the corridor. All right, so close that off, please, SJ. So in our Switch classroom, each one of our lessons has a video. The video is followed by a short multiple choice questions. Um, and then we have some uh, kind of summative activities, a little more cognitive experience and a little more, um, and I do want to show this once this is gone, there we go. Okay, when you work through the site, so for example, we just answered that, you're gonna click the next button. In order to get it registered, teachers, they're gonna have to click this next, next button. And then we come into our short answer questions. And in this one, we ask, we ask questions like, what are the six criteria that Dr. Tinker used in here? Pick three of those criteria and have your student you know, elaborate on that. And then do you think when we look at other, other states that are in this corridor, um, do you think um, your state could take advantage of wind power? Is it in the corridor? Is it along the coast where we got some pretty good wind on the coast? Um, and so we have video, multiple choice questions, and then short answer questions. I'm back to my PowerPoint here. I hope I'm doing great on time, which I am. Um, the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to this NRA, uh, no, that's right, I'm gonna do a poll. So the next thing I wanna do is uh, based on our short answer questions that we have, uh, we've got a poll. This is not a right answer or a wrong answer, but it looks at the, we want you to look at these six criteria and what is your opinion of what's the most important one? So the question asks, which of the six criteria for making wind work as an energy source is the most important? Is it that you have to have good wind? Is it that you have to have willing neighbors, close to users, wind has to be close to the user, uh, existing transmission lines, ability to build new lines, or is it backup generation? What is the, what do you think is the most important of these six criteria? And again, there is no right answer. So what is your opinion? Okay, so one, one, picker, one person has picked backup generation. Okay, wind is intermittent. Dr. Tinker shows that with his little um, hair dryer. Um, sometimes it's not blowing at all. Um, sometimes it's blowing really hard. Um, you're generating lots of electricity that way. Um, and sometimes it's not blowing too hard. Um, so you're not generating as much electricity, but we need electricity 
24 seven. And so we have to have some sort of backup. Uh, let's see, I got another vote, another vote for backup generation. Um, so I'm gonna stop the poll, okay? Uh, my personal opinion is the first thing you got to have is wind. Uh, you don't have wind, you, you, you really can't generate a lot of electricity from the wind. Uh, but backup generation is a critical part to it. So is having willing neighbors. Um, you are never going to get wind farms off the coast of Southern California where I live. Um, maybe outside of Catalina, so you can't see them, they're over the horizon. Uh, there's only one on the east side, it's uh, in Rhode Island, um, and they're just three windmills. Um, so it's very, very difficult to build these things off of people's coast. Uh, so we're going to go to our next question and then we're going to end this with the Cliff Etheridge. I just want you to walk out of here. I want you to go back to this video about Cliff Etheridge. Um, but right now I want to have one more poll. This is the National Renewable Energy Labs poll. I mean, um, map of wind at 100 meters high, which is roughly the height of some of these wind, uh, wind turbines. And you can see that corridor rides right up, right up through from Texas at the base all the way up into Canada. And I wanna check your geography right now. So we're gonna put up our next poll because all these states up above Texas have really not taken advantage of wind. Um, they have some beautiful wind in there, but they haven't taken advantage of it. There's a number of reasons why, uh, but what is one of the states? Okay, so poll is up. Using that map right there, um, identify, I'm gonna put it over here, identify a state that should be taking advantage of its onshore wind. Okay, is it Utah? Is Utah in the corridor? I don't know, gotta be able to read a map. Uh, know your states. Arkansas, Nebraska, or Illinois? Only one is correct though. Use the map. You know, one thing about these polls when I do them, um, I make sure it's anonymous so you don't see who. Students do not like to be known if they make the answer correct. Um, I'm, I'm gonna close the poll. No one, no one put a vote in there. Um, and SJ is going to give us the results. The actual answer for this is Nebraska. Um, if you've ever traveled through Nebraska, there's not that many big cities um, in Nebraska. Um, it's pretty open wide plains and, uh, but Nebraska has the opportunity The Dakotas, which are up above there as well, have some really fabulous wind, but they don't have any big cities. They don't have the original trans transmission lines. And there's a lot of people that they don't want wind turbines in their backyard. All right, so we're gonna switch over this last thing. Um, I really love this video. I want you to think about it. We want you to think about energy. It's super important to our world. Um, and there are people out there that um, really make the world a great place. And this gentleman that we're gonna listen to his video, he's a Texas entrepreneur. Um, he got in his head that he was gonna take advantage of the wind that's out there in West Texas. Um, and if you, I'm not gonna show you the whole story, but watch it, the whole story, and you're gonna find out all the different steps that he had to go through to get the, his wind farm, his Roscoe wind farm funded. And we're gonna watch about two or three minutes of Cliff Etheridge is his name. He's a savvy cotton farmer um, that started a wind farm. All right. Boy, it's a beautiful morning. Yes. <laughs> Sunshine, finally. Yeah. You were born and raised in this community. Yeah, I was. I've lived here all my life. It wasn't very long ago there weren't any turbines out here. You're, you're a pioneer. I don't want to take all the blame now. <laughs> <laughs> I was always curious about these things. They, they really fascinated me. And there's a, uh, some windmills put up south of Big Spring about 15 years ago, and, and uh, I never did get up close to them, but I could see them, and I could see how big they were and, and how magnificent they were to me. And then when they began building wind farms south of Sweetwater, really got my attention, and the more I studied it. Uh, the more uh, I learned that we had a, a, a world-class wind resource here, and there was no reason why we shouldn't be able to develop yeah. this flat farmland. Yeah. I believe we've got 631 windmills. 
in this wind park. And you say they're getting bigger. What are you up to now? What are, what are some of your larger ones? Well, 30 miles north of here, we there's a wind farm that's uh, three that has 21 3 megawatt windmills. Okay. Trend is is larger all the time, and uh, there are some offshore windmills that are in the seven and a half to 10 megawatt range. And uh, the, it's huge, tall. Tower. Yes. Look at the roads, the lines. Yeah. Those things are just spectacular. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's becoming some empirical science to the spacing. What's the distance between them laterally and then between rows? Is that? Rule of thumb, and, and it depends on the topography, is three to five rotor diameters. That's the swept area of okay. the rotors between windmills. Okay. And then between rows of windmills is 10 to 15 rotor diameters. Okay. So it, it's all determined by the, the size of the windmill, the swept area of the, okay. of the blades. Because you've got wind coming through here, and if I, if I take a little fan out and blow wind through it, there's turbulence behind that. Yes. So you need some kind of air that's not disturbed on that next row. To have clean air for the next row. That's exactly right. So clean air takes on a little different meaning yes. in your business. <laughs> yes, it does. You can farm and ranch underneath these. They don't take much of the That's land. Three to five percent of the land is all it's taken. Okay. It does interrupt the efficiency of the farming because those roads sometimes cross the rows right. of crops. So you got to go around them with your yeah. plows and your harvesters yeah. and your combine? The only uh, common farming practice that can't be done with windmills is aerial application of, of pesticides, oh. herbicides, gotcha. whatever. So the crop dusters can't get out That's here. right. So the farmers do it with ground rigs. Interesting. I mean, the landowners benefit here. What kind of royalty are they getting? <laughs> this industry is so new that it's, uh, there's, there's really not a standard uh, arrangement yet, but here in the Roscoe wind farm, and it's been, is, I believe, becoming more common, uh, is a hundred dollars an acre per year. Now that's from the generation of electricity. That's the royalty payments. Right. So more and, than twice what they're getting farming. Yes. We're looking at a row of four turbines here. They're, they're tall. I mean, just give me a quick feel for. The blades are a hundred feet long. These are Mitsubishi one megawatts, about the smallest one still being installed commercially today, and a 60 meter tower on these. These will be the shortest ones we'll see today. Okay. At full capacity, it'll generate one megawatt per hour. Okay. And that's enough electricity to uh, power about 300 to 350 average size homes. Okay. Roscoe Wind Farm, 780. Uh, megawatts in it will power about 265,000 homes. That's the nameplate capacity. That's a, that, that would be the actual output at maximum generation capacity if we didn't have curtailment. Curtailment on the transmission lines means they can't produce at full capacity because we don't have the transmission lines to carry all of the electricity generated. Okay. ERCOT Energy Reliability Council of Texas is the, the uh, organization that's responsible for the distribution of electricity in Texas, and it's, it's their job to keep the lights on mm -hmm. everywhere. They continue to improve the system, but they play fair with everybody. It doesn't matter how long you've been on transmission line or how long you've been generating, you, you're curtailed if there's overproduction just like everybody else is. But so this transmission grid is a very important component of this, uh, and it's getting, it sounds like, smarter and smarter. Yes. The plan is, has come together, and it's working, and it's, uh, the developers are sitting, waiting, ready to build wind farms to overload the next set of transmission <laughs> lines. <so. laughs> You've got 780 megawatts here in Roscoe. That's the biggest in the world. but. A, a lot more than that in this in this broad area. Nolan County uh, has three of the four largest wind farms in the world. In the world. In the, are headquartered in this county. 
How many megawatts are you talking about in this region? Oh, in, in, in Nolan, well, within, within 100 miles of here, there's probably five or six gigawatts. So 5,000 to 6,000 megawatts. Yes. That's yes. more than any other yeah. state total. If Nolan County was a state in the United States, it'd be ranked second in the nation behind the rest of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> one county. Yeah, one county. We are surrounded by wind turbines. I cannot look in any direction and not see them. You really led this thing in many ways, and I know you're a modest person, but four or five years ago, if I was standing right here with you, we'd be looking at farmland and ranchland. Right. That's right. right, that's right. What did it take to put that together, really? I had no concept of how it'd be done, if one company could do it, if we'd take a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, but organizing the landowners and then getting a project put together that might be acceptable to a developer was the easy part. Yeah. <laughs> the hard part was finding a developer. Okay. In October, I went to a... Of 04? Of 04. Okay. I went to a, a finance and investment workshop huh. in New York City. Took these presentations and passed them out and tried to meet people and talk to them. And sure enough, I found a banker in Philadelphia that referred me to a new company in Chicago from Dublin. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I called them, Air Tristy uh -huh. was their name. Sure enough, they were interested. After sending them all the information I could gather up about this thing, they came down and looked, and the whole system came together. The whole plan came together. They, they recognized the potential here. Fantastic. And this first 7,000 acres, they wanted to expand to the 32,000 acres, which we did for them. And this is a community that's welcoming this with open arms. Yes. Up. It's turned our communities around. We've got, for the first time ever, these, yeah. these landlords have an opportunity to receive a regular paycheck. Steady. Our school has sat there with about 300, 310 enrollment for 50 years. Okay. Since the wind farm is built, the last two years, the enrollment at Roscoe has increased 40 students. Huh. The first increase ever yeah. in our enrollment school. To me, that's the best indicator yeah. of the benefits of the wind farm, other than the actual dollars that's being pumped into our community. Yeah. But uh, the that's, that's that's the neat. first and the greatest benefit. I highly recommend you go out to this uh, to our site. There's lots of educational material here. The, the questions are, are multiple choice questions are great for each video. Uh, this one is one of the energy experts, Cliff Etheridge. Um, so I'm going to leave you with our website information for Switch Energy Alliance. Uh, we just created Switch Classroom, which is an education energy platform uh, for you to engage your students in all sorts of uh, topics around the subject of energy. Uh, you can go to the switchon.org website. Our feature film is, is available right there. <coughs> uh, the trailer is available. And then if you want to sign up your students, you want to go to classroom.switchon.org. Uh, sign up your students. Give them a class token, they can sign up. You can watch them progress. Uh, my eighth grade students have done two different units. We're doing harnessing human energy for eighth grade NGSS in California. And they're gonna go back to about four or five, but I can see all my students. I can go, hey, you're not watching the video. You need to get on the video. At this point, you should be at the multiple choice question. And I can see exactly all the way down the line, all of my students and whether they are progressing through the, uh, through the unit. Um, thank you very much for the Bureau of Economic Geology for having Switch Energy Alliance on. Um, thank you for all the students that are watching this and uh, have, a great, have a great day. Jim, thank you. Thank you very much. And SJ, I appreciate it that you've joined our efforts. This is the inaugural session for our Austin Earth Science Zoomerama. Thank Ooh. you very much. And to our audience, I, I want you to know that we will be posting this video uh, onto our website. It's, so if you go to the Zoomerama page, 
uh, you can see all of the all of the different uh, presentations we have coming up every Tuesday and Thursday in October. We'll have one for the one that you just saw. You can go to the Switch Classroom. You'll see all of the resources, the quizzes, the PDF of the presentation, as well as the video. So please share this information with your friends. Thank you for joining us. And I hope we see you again in some of our other sessions. Thank you very much.